All right, I think we'll do it. Looks like we've got quite a few people on. It's hard to tell, but. That's great, yes. So, so some bookkeeping from our end at Fifth and Wine to start with. Um, next week, we have uh, sent out an email this afternoon um, kind of talking about what we're doing. We've got four reds and one white. Sorry, all you white lovers, but um, I don't know. There's, there's a lot more red, red drinkers than white, than white drinkers. And, um, so that's what we're doing next week. Um, we did add one um, kind of expensive Pinot Noir from um, um, Willamette Valley. Yep. So, so it's, it's 110 this week instead of 100 for five wines, um, but it'll be fun. Uh, we've got five volunteers, nobody from Chile or Argentina or South Africa, but um, we have American winemakers next week. Um, so that'll be fun. Uh, don't forget we have brunch tomorrow. So we're doing our full brunch menu. It's online at fifthandwine.com. Um, we're also doing mimosas by the, by the glass. Apparently we're allowed to do that now. Oh, there's been a few good things about this um, shutdown, I guess. One is we can serve wine by the glass and you can take it with you. We can deliver wine, which is uh, uh, fun, I guess. And what is it, Tara? Pineapple? Pineapple upside down cake is our special mimosa tomorrow. We also always have grapefruit and orange. So we'll have three mimosas available tomorrow. Um, and we also have mimosas by the bottle with both mango and um, orange in a, in a full bottle of 750. Um, we have eight salmon sandwiches left tonight. Our friends Bob and Kim DeLong are on this call tonight and they had it today and they gave me a thumbs up. Um, I think it's fun. We talk about at Fifth and Wine a lot. I want my sandwiches messy. I want when you get done, you should have to have like three napkins that are dripping with uh, sauce and whatnot. And Guy Fieri, if you guys ever watch that, um, that's kind of his thing. He loves to have Sandwiches that drip with sauce. And so if you have that tomorrow, be one of the first eight. And then I don't know if anybody uh, had the Roadhouse Diners um, special burger today from Fifth and Wine, but we created a um, aioli for them out of uh, a, a red wine called the Sauce. Is that out of California, Kathy? I think, or is it Washington? Washington State. So it's a, it's a blend and we did an aioli with shallots and um, I don't know, peppers and all kinds of fun stuff. And it was very tasty. And we just had one of those. And it turns out it pairs pretty well with this uh, wine that, that we're having tonight. So I think that's kind of the bookkeeping end of Fifth and Wine. So maybe we'll get started. Um, hopefully you guys got, to, got our email earlier and you got to watch that video um, that, that um, Cristobal uh, and his family created about his winery in Chile. Um, we tried to play it on Zoom. And it just was so delayed that we decided we weren't going to do that. And so if you didn't get to watch it, watch it afterwards. I think it's fun to have that in your mind's eye. We, this is our first um, international winemaker that we got to, to join us. Um, and so I think this is going to be a fun night. I guess that's, that's just what I think. And I think it, it's going to be um, fun to have Cristobal in our living rooms from a few thousand miles away. And so we'll start with you, Cristobal, if that's okay. Kind of, can you tell us a little bit, I was on your website and it said your family is sixth generation um, winemakers, farmers. Um, can you tell us kind of the story of your family and where, how that all started, maybe the immigration story and whatever, whatever you feel like talking about. That's great. So first of all, thanks everybody to be here this night. So, salud. Huh? Salud. It's a, it's a big pleasure, you know, to share a little bit about uh, our winery and to talk about the, first of all, about the history of my family. So we start uh, in the wine business was uh, my great grandfather who started in 1885 when he, uh, when he founded the Undurraga winery. That's my family name. At that time, uh, in the 1870, he went to Bordeaux in France to learn about wines. Uh, at that time, many Argentinians and Chilean uh, people went to France to study. You know, some of those people uh, was interested to, uh, to learn about wines at that time. And he bring at that time uh, the first vines from Bordeaux, the Carmenere, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Petit Verdot, the Malbec. 
Cabernet uh, Franc. At that time, it was just red cepach, you know, and uh, they, he bring the, that, those varieties. They start the wine business in 1885, close to Santiago. Uh, and that was the origin of my family. Uh, after that, uh, another four, four generations uh, is, is, uh, was uh, still working in the wine. And uh, here we are with Coile today and with my brothers and my family here. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal experience, kind of your background and how you ended up? I know the family was in the wine business, but did you do something else in the meantime and came back? Or were you always in the family yeah. wine business? You know, I, I grew up in the, in the vineyard. I, I grew up surrounded by, by tanks, barrels, uh, vines. And when I finished my university, my college, you know, I studied winemaking and viticulture in, uh, here in Chile. I decided to, to go over the, around the world, you know, to learn in different areas. I was wishing, you know, to learn about uh, uh, the viticulture and the winemaking process in different parts. So I started actually in Napa. Uh, that was in 2000. After that, I went to Australia to do winemaking a, a vintage in Australia. From Australia, I moved to Bordeaux and I was working in Bordeaux at that time in 2001. After Bordeaux, I moved to Argentina to work in Mendoza for another five years. And since that, uh, in 2006, we start with Coile, with my family, uh, this beautiful project. That's fun. And what is your current role with the winery? I'm the winemaker and the viticulture of the, uh, the winery. It's a, it's a family uh, business. Uh, we we manage, you know, uh, a little size winery, you know, we are 100% uh, biodynamic. Uh, we are pretty much focused on the terroir. Our wines are 100% single vineyard. And I live here in the property, you know, with my family. It's a lovely place to live. And um, I care about the wines. I care about the viticulture. And also I care about the, the selling of the wines with my partner here in, the, in this group, Cristobal. He's in there, Cristobal. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, um, we had a winemaker on last week from Oregon um, that yep. was kind of one of the leaders in the Oregon wine biodynamic um, movement. And we, not all of us got to hear that story. And I'm sure it's different anyway from uh, the Chilean uh, perspective. So can you just kind of walk us through the biodynamic uh, world and why you think it's important and what's going on in your vineyard compared to people that aren't doing biodynamic? and just kind of expound on that whole, I know it's important to you guys, so I'd like to hear about it. You know, just to easily explain to everybody about biodynamic, uh, uh, first of all, we work as an organic vineyard, so we don't spray any chemical products from fertilization, from insecticide, from fungicide, from every, uh, all herbicides, or all the things that kill, finally. You know, uh, we're looking to keep the life in the place. First of all, we love all the to keep all the ecosystem because that is the base of the expression of the terroir the expression of the land and when we are looking for unique wines we are when we are looking to don't have standard wines uh, another coca-cola in the wine you know there are many wines that is nice they're okay but we're looking to express our own place each place in the big in, in the good and serious wines in the world are expression of the place so that was our focus. We start doing biodynamic as a step over, you know, the organic. It's basically, you know, a kind of homeopathic medicine for the land. So it's homeopathic when, we, when you use organic products. When you, in, in our case, we use natural products that we grew up in our state. Flowers, you know, uh, we ferment different things. And, those are the products that we use for the compost that we make and also to give energy to the land, to give energy to the vines. And those, uh, those searching, you know, will mark how the biodynamic is. Two important things to, start, uh, to understand a little bit about biodynamic is we are, you know, always keeping the whole ecosystem not just the vineyard, we are looking for the animals, we are looking for the birds, we are looking for the insects, we are looking for all the living life also in the soil, underground, you know. All that 
will give life to the wines and all will make more unique wines finally. When did you start the biodynamic process? Did, was it right when you bought it or was it already biodynamic when you purchased it? Or? I met my, uh, my first partner in biodynamic when I was working in Australia. It was a French guy there. Uh, he was a bit of a bit of culture there. Uh, and I started in Coile in 2008. Once I took two years to convince my family, you know, my brothers and my father uh, to go in. My, my family was coming from a very traditional way to make agriculture, you know, and to convince my family to go over, you know, and to do it, everything organic and biodynamic was, uh, uh, I took a couple of years to do that. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, so we, you, you uh, import in the United States, I think, to Natural Merchants and Lisa Bell. She's, a, she's been a great follower. She's a friend of ours. Hi, Lisa. So can you tell us, I guess, why you chose Natural mer Merchants? Was just lucky. No. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a nice history, you know, because uh, uh, we was working since uh, we started in the United States with an uh, importer in Napa. And that importer, you know, we, we started, you know, uh, a beautiful relation, but finally he, uh, pre uh, he preferred to concentrate in, in more big wineries. So that was happening in 2016. I was in Bale in, uh, in Colorado. Uh, I, I used to go there with my family some years to skiing. And I met with my importer in Colorado, my distributor in Colorado, Bob Cohen. Lovely guy, lovely guy. And that was happening in 2016. I tell Bob that I want, was looking for a new importer in the US. And he told me, I think I have the perfect importer for you. It's a guy who is 100% uh, concentrated, you know, in quality wines, in niche wine, family uh, owned projects, and also biodynamic and organic. He concentrated in those kind of wines. And I was happy to hear that because it's very different uh, when you're working with people who understand about what you are doing. And uh, also people who are 100% concentrated in that. And I met Edward Phil, the owner of Natural Merchants. I met with Lisa as well there in Boulder. Uh, Lisa being here at home with his, uh, with his partner, you know, also uh, was with Edward as well, uh, was We've been uh, enjoying with family here, and uh, since th almost three years, we are working with uh, Natural Merchants. We are very happy, you know, it's a beautiful partner, you know, and uh, well, here we are. It's thanks, Natural Merchant, we are all together today, huh? Nice. Lisa, can we bring you into the conversation for just a second? Yeah, you bet. All right, so you and I, you and I have met, you, you did a wine tasting up at Eagle Beverage in the upstairs there, and, we, uh, we fell in love with a couple of your rosés. In fact, we put them on our um, um, by the glass menu at our store. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about natural merchants? And then you and I talked about it earlier today about the word natural wine is a real buzzword going on right now in, in the wine world and kind of controversial a little bit, you know, like what is natural wine to you? And why did you guys decide to go, you know, into the into that side of the business, like Cristobal just talked about with the small family wineries and the biodynamic and organic and whatever. Sure. Um, so Natural Merchants is 15 years old this year. And uh, as Cristobal said, it was founded by Ed Field. Ed was a retailer in Oregon once upon a time and um, had convinced his store to have a point of difference and that was going to be organic. And um, there was a lot of competition in the area in the retail business. And because they had an organic focus, they were able to compete with someone like Walmart across the street because they had a real point of difference. And the sales just exploded from there. Um, Ed uh, was on a backpacking trip in um, Morocco and literally ran into Pilar, his wife-to-be, on one of the back roads and um, they met, they fell in love, long story short, they ended up, he ended up moving to Spain and um, the company 
started there and they decided to import organic wines, organic foods and organic wines at the time uh, from Spain to the US. And uh, eventually they, they made the focus organic wines. Um, the company has been completely dedicated to certified organic and biodynamic wines. So everything that we have in the portfolio has a certification behind it. Um, be it wines that are made with organic grapes there or biodynamic as the Coile wines are um, Everything is certified to US standards. So that's a whole different um, Level of certification as well um, So the US standards are are higher than they are in Europe and um, So we we make sure that all of our suppliers have that um, our name is Natural Merchants, and so naturally, natural wines are, are part of that. Um, a natural wine doesn't really have a definition, however, so there's no legal definition of, of natural. Now, the French just came up with um, a, a natural, natural van um, certification program, and they have their own definition of that. For us, what we believe first and foremost is that the wines have to be great quality. Um, they must again be either organic or biodynamic. Um, and they have to taste good first and foremost because people don't want to drink a wine that tastes like vinegar and smells like a barn. I always, I always say, if you, if you really want a, nat a natural wine, uh, be careful what you ask for because sometimes you might get something that you're not expecting. In a, yeah, in the, a most, the most natural wine is really a vinegar, right? The most, <laughs> sure. The most, if, you, if you do nothing with, uh, with wine in the fermentation tank, it, it, it could become vinegar, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but so it, all wines have to be organic, biodynamic. Um, natural wines have low, um, low intervention. So there's not a lot going on, on in either the vineyards or in, in the production. But still, again, the, the wine has to be great quality. And so the winemaker is absolutely going to, to be um, doing everything natural in their power to, to make a fantastic wine. Um, but there, there's not harsh manipulation of the wine. So there's not a great deal of filtration. There's, not, um, there's no harsh chemicals. There's no toxic chemicals added to wine. Um, there are more than a thousand chemicals that can be in a conventional wine. And no one has to put that on their label. So you sometimes you don't know what you're what you're getting. Um, and you know the it's sometimes the grapes are hand picked as well. Um, and then minimal sulfites added um, in biodynamic and organic wine um, standards. We can have up to a hundred parts per million, uh, but uh, the most of our wines don't don't come even close to that. Um, Cristobal, what do you what do you think is the level about of sulfites in in this wine that we're drinking today? So one of the interesting things is uh, about the talking about the uh, Lisa. Uh, I always say, and when I start with Coile, my way to do a biodynamic viticulture, you know, in the beginning, was to preserve the land and also to keep the quality of the grapes. That's it's a key thing because when we want to make a nice plate of food, for example, we're looking for the best ingredients, first of all. So my way to do biodynamic was to have the best quality of grapes. First, second of all, you know, uh, your question, Lisa, is about sulfites. That is a big issue because we all want to drink wine and don't have a hangover the other day. So uh, the sulfite, you know, sometimes it's very hard you know, in the because uh, wines who have 150 or sometimes even more of uh, total sulfites, you know, that is the permitted. Uh, when we're talking about uh, biodynamic wines, the the limit is 75 parts. Uh, our wines are all around 
40, 50, 60 could be sometimes, no more than that. So it's less than one third of sulfides. And that sulfide is just all combined. So it says, it's a bear. finally, as, you, as we, I think, all trying to do, wine for me is part of the food. Wine is a, should be part of our diet. But we want a healthy wine. We, was, we want a nice wine. We want tasty wine. But also, why not um, um, healthy, you know? So, of course, sometimes people are afraid to know about uh, natural wines. Uh, uh, was talking about sometimes natural, natural wines could be a little bit, uh, a lot of volatile or vinegar notes. For me, first of all, is the quality. Even, even more important than the, if it's certificate organic or biodynamic. Quality is first of all. Price is also very important for me because we want to have uh, wines uh, that are good value and we, we, you know, we really feel that our wines are a big value. That's important. And I'll, finally, you know, to be enjoyable. That's important. So, uh, Christopher, I was in Bordeaux a few years ago and I was in touring organic and biodynamic. Actually, I think just organic. And I went to a, a property in Graves and the owner has, has, like you guys, had been in the business for three or four or five generations. And I asked him about organic and he was very offended by it. He's like, we do nothing to our earth that um, would hurt it or, you know, kind of the story was, I think some winemakers are getting tired of this. Are you organic? Are you biodynamic? And I think uh, Lisa and I talked about it earlier today. It's, it's a real trend in our world. We're getting asked all the time now what wines we have that are organic or biodynamic. But I was wondering what kind of the, what, what's the scene in Chile? What's going on in the, in the biodynamic world or organic world in Chile? Is that, is it common down there or is it, is it, un, is it uncommon what you guys do? This is still, you know, a, a few very low percentage of wineries biodynamic and, by, and organic. So today, last year we formed the first uh, biodynamic uh, organization of wineries in Chile. We are 10 in total, just 10, uh, from a, a group of more than 300 wineries in Chile. So if you think that is less than 0.5%, uh, you know, it's a very, very few. It's a very f a little group, but they are an enormous interest, you know, uh, especially I, if I have to tell you, you know, all the icon wineries in Chile, all those guys who are selling the the top wines in Chile, you know, uh, the most, most expensive wines or uh, the, the wineries who always are in the top of the ratings, you know, all the guys are visiting us. You know, it, it, they are big interest and you can see in the world, you know, I was lucky to work in Chateau Margaux, in, in uh, Margaux in, in Bordeaux as well, in 2001. And at that time, already Chateau Margaux, that is a, at that time was more than 300 uh, years of history, they was doing little by little organic management. Today, Chateau Margaux is biodynamic. They don't do, they don't say nothing in the label yet, but they are biodynamic. You know, the most expensive wine in the world, Romane Conti from uh, Burgundy, you know, a bottle of Romane Conti, I don't know how much is uh, in the States, but could be 5,000 uh, bucks. It, one bottle, you know, it's a it very was, unique yeah. wine. I just bought some, it's like $3,000 on the shelf, right? No, it's crazy. And also that the Romane Conti is 100% biodynamic. Uh, you have in, uh, in Napa today, you have many wineries, you know, focus on terroir, doing biodynamic. In Chile, it's a moving, movement who is growing. Uh, we, the first winery in Chile who start was uh, Emiliana. They are big, uh, big friends and partners, you know, Emiliana, they was very pioneering, you know, starting in 2000 uh, with uh, as a as a biodynamic winery. They was pushed by the Fetzer family from Mendocino in California. Uh, they do very well, uh, and they are all the group of uh, wineries that I visiting around the world who work in biodynamic are for me are all of those wines who really express the uniqueness of the of the land, you know, even. In Barolo, if you're going to Rivera del Duero, Rioja in Spain, or if you want to go, you know, to New Zealand or Australia, 
they are biodynamic wineries all around and all are fantastic project because it is is where you can see life in the place and that for me is fantastic when looking for quality nice well maybe we should move on to the wine that's in everybody's glass does everybody have a little bit of the carmenere left so Cristobal, could you tell us a little bit about um, the Carmenier uh, varietal in general, kind of its history? I know it's been called the Lost Grape of Bordeaux and maybe the history even in Chile of it and then to kind of the, how it grows and how you vinify it and kind of, you know, that whole story before we get on to the actual wine that you've made, but just kind of the Carmenier varietal in general. Yes, I, I, first of all, I will fill my glass Everybody can fill his glass because it's low tide here in Chile. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, Carmener is a, it's a beautiful history, actually. Uh, because Carmener, uh, when we start talking today, I, I'm talking about my great-grandfather when he went to Bordeaux. That was in 1870. At that time, all the guys from South America here who went even people from California went to Bordeaux, you know, to study uh, viticulture, winemaking. They bring vines from France because uh, in the in the area in Chile was just Spanish varieties. It was a uh, Criolla, a uh, Pais, all uh, uh, very table grapes, you know, more simple like uh, Mission in uh, in California. All those grapes who was bring from uh, Spanish guys, but at the time that the first French varieties came, was blended all together. In Chile, after many years, the main cepage was Cabernet Sauvignon. The agriculture was start selecting the Cabernet Sauvignon as the best cepage, you know, in terms of color, in terms of different things. But they keep the Merlot, they keep the Carmener, they keep the Cabernet Franc as co complements for blending, you know. And was just in the 90s, when in Chile start selecting the different cepage, the different varieties, and they separate Cabernet Sauvignon, they separate Malbec, they separate uh, Cabernet Franc, they separate Petit Verdot, and also they separate Merlot as one group. And was two kind of Merlot in Chile, was the French Merlot, that is the French, the Merlot that everybody knows, and the Chilean Merlot was called it. Was a very similar to, Mer, uh, to Merlot, uh, uh, was coming from the Merlot family, as the Merlot family came from Cabernet. And Chile starts exporting Merlot as Carmenet. And it was just in 1994 when a, a French guy, a French viticulture, recognized Carmenet in Chile. And was a very strange cepage in terms of uh, Bordeaux was almost disappearing the Carmenet after a big uh, disease in, at, the, at the end of the 19th cycle in, a, in, in a Bordeaux, Carmener was almost extinct. The, the viticultures there didn't re, uh, replant Carmener because it was a very late ripe cepage. And Carmener was almost extinct in the world. Nobody know about Carmener. And in Chile was founded again. So in Chile was start, like in the beginning was a big, trend to have Carmener, people start uh, making the first Carmener 100% in the beginning of 2000. And Carmener, if I have to tell how about Carmener, it's a very soft cepage, you know? It's like you can see here in this uh, Carmener, for me, I always surprised about the, the silkiness of the tannins of the Carmener, the beautiful uh, smooth of the wine, you know? It's, uh, it's a, it's a lovely uh, cepage to, to drink. Oh. Oh. All right, I'll start over. I was muted. <laughs> um, I have a barking dog right now. So. Uh, anyway, so one of the things we don't think about in North America or the Northern Hemisphere is that you guys actually harvest in uh, what, March or April, is it? So this is the two south, uh, the one we have is 2017 vintage. Yep. Um, so maybe you could talk about um, the, the vintage itself in Chile. And in, in, I don't know, if, I don't know enough about Chilean wine to know, do you guys get big um, variances in your, in your, um, 
in your vintages? Like Oregon is much different than Cal California is much more even in, in Oregon. Sometimes, you know, you can get lighter, lighter styles and, and heavier styles. What's Chile's uh, vintages season to season like? You know, I think uh, we are all surprised about the big uh, climate change in the world. So uh, whatever, if you believe in the, in the global warming or but we are all seeing big change in the global uh, weather, you know, in the weather forecast, climate, you know, uh, big change uh, in Chile. We are suffering, you know, in the last 10 years, the, the, the longer draft period, you know, since we have statistics, you know, in the, since 200 years ago. The uh, world is changing uh, very quick. And those changes are, I think, even sometimes more quick than we are allowed to, to adapt it. But one of the things that uh, I see in, the, in our vineyards, when you treat the vineyards naturally, you know, yes. that you, you keep those vines more active. Those vines are a little bit more sensible with the environment that they are, and they can predict better than us what is happening with each vintage. So, Definitely each vintage is different. For me, I, I have uh, three kinds of vintages, easily to describe. Thinking always, you know, trying to describe something more, more fa easy to understand. So in Chile, we have mainly three kinds. The cold vintages that are, are coming one of the rare vintages, cold and rainy. The mild vintages, so mild vintages are those years that are not too hot, not too cold, not cold, still dry, you know. And one, uh, the, the most common in the last year, vintages are the warm vintages, very warm, very dry, you know, uh, a lot of concentration. So, for example, if we're talking about this 2017 vintage sheet, there we are, 17. <laughs> uh, th 17 was a very warm year, very dry. Uh, in terms of a yield per vine was uh, uh, from the average to the lowest. So you can find in this Carmenera a lot of lovely concentration. But for me, the most uh, difficult years in terms of expression of the land are those years more dry, more warm. Some, peoples, some people uh, th prefer that warm years because you have more ripeness, you have more richness. But those uh, dry, dry years are years where you can see the, the whole environment a little bit more dry. Um, I personally love those years when you have more green around. There are more life, like uh, was just few vintages in the last 10 years, 16 and 11 was those very dry, uh, very rainy years. Very unique wines. Some people don't, don't understand those years but I think are years with a very long-term uh, vision. Uh, years like uh, 15, 17, 18 was warm and dry. Of course, the ripeness in the wines are fantastic. Our uh, wines uh, lovely in terms of a smoothness. You can feel in this uh, Carmenera a lot, a lot of notes of uh, spiciness. If you see guys in the, in the aromas in this wine, some notes of cedar, cedar, tobacco notes, some uh, wet tobacco notes, a little bit of red, uh, bell, red bell pepper notes as well, a little bit of crunchy pepper as well. So all that spiciness is very useful in the, very easy to find in this wine. Um, for me, and I always say, Carmenet is a wine easy to drink. So I, I look a lot of cobbles here. Uh, I, with my wife, that is, was just uh, finishing, you know, uh, help me, you know, to clean everything. Um, it's a wine, lovely wine to to share. I think that uh, it's very lovely. A couple, couple of birds. Yeah. I think um, so. Christopher, I put this in an email to you earlier today. So in in the northern hemisphere, we try to do this with our wine when we swirl it, right? The southern hemisphere, we try to go backwards, like like your uh, like your cyclones do. And, and allegedly in America, we, we always hear about the toilets go backwards in, 
in the southern hemisphere. So everybody try to throw your wine backwards. You're going in the northern hemisphere, you're going from from left to right or from right to left? Up here we go uh, to the right. There's the barking dog. And then uh, down down in the southern hemisphere, I think you should go start to the left. So. Absolutely. Practice. Yeah. I don't it? know how about how about you, Chris, Christopher, my, my partner there? You going from left to right or right to left? No, right to left, always. <laughs> <laughs> I actually looked this up today on, on Google and it, I said, the toilets really flush backwards in the Southern Hemisphere and they said no. But the actual, the truth is there's, some, there's somebody on here that probably knows what it's called, Coriolis effect, I think, or something. Um, and it, the actual, the typhoons that you guys call them actually do go backwards um well not backwards i guess that's 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 insulting but they go the opposite direction of the northern hemisphere um what we call hurricanes so, anyway yeah um tell us about other uh wines that you are that you are that are popular what, what else goes on in your vineyard i know you have a car, uh, cabernet sauvignons do you do white wines just kind of tell us the whole I don't know what, maybe Heather, you could jump on and tell us what you guys um, have in the, in the warehouse too. Yeah, uh, definitely. So we are basically, you know, very concentrated on Bordeaux varieties. So we work uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon as well. We work Carmenet. We have a touch of Rhone with a Syrah, a lovely Syrah. I think my partner, uh, Cristobal, today is, is not drinking our same wine because he He's also in quarantine. So in Chile, we are all in quarantine, you know, uh, because this uh, coronavirus and uh, we are isolated in our houses. I think my, my colleague Cristobal is already drink all the, the Grand Reserva and he's drinking now another wine, you know. Which one are you drinking tonight, uh, Cristobal? Um, I didn't have a Grand Reserva line because I drink it obviously but i always have a spare one that's the royale line this is a cab uh really nice from 2015. um we have different lines in in coile this is one of them the royale line uh we have the grand reserva line then it's the royale line a little bit higher then the cerro basalto and finally, our iconic wine that's called Auma in honor of uh, Cristobal's father. Also, we have uh, white wines that, are, that comes from the coast of Chile, just nine kilometers. Uh, really nice ones. We have Sauvignon Blanc there and also Pinot Noir. Uh, really nice ones. We have pretty much uh, in the vineyard, we have, I don't know if he, Cristobal said it before, but we have uh, 12 different varieties. So we have uh, lots of lots of different wines for anyone who likes different stuff. We have Malbec, uh, Merlot, Cabernet, Cabernet, Carignan, lots of different wines. Uh, in this line, we have uh, Cab, we have Carmener, we have Malbec, we have Tempranillo, and we have, um, which one am I missing? Also Malbec. And Syrah. And Syrah. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting, as you say, Cristobal, you know, uh, in that range of wines that we have, uh, our two uh, selection of blocks that we make from our state, you know, one of those are calling Cerro Basalto. Cerro means a little mount, and that mount is a very special place in the top of our vineyard in the third terrace. So that we're looking to the top of the mountains where we have our planted, our vineyards. We have that, uh, that wine. We also have a, a wine called Auma. So Auma uh, is, a, is a wine uh, very special. That was always, you know, my, my dream uh, since we start with Coile. It's a, a Bordeaux blend. It's a blend of six different Bordeaux varieties. So we have a blended there, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carmenet, Malbec, Cabernet Franc, a, a touch of Petit Verdot and Merlot. Uh, those wines are very special, you know, 
the the one that Cristobal also uh, talk about is the Sauvignon Blanc. We make uh, white a Sauvignon Blanc coming from the coast. Uh, that Sauvignon Blanc for me, uh, what is special about that Sauvignon Blanc that is a uh, extremely drinkable Sauvignon Blanc. So <laughs> are those wines who are, you drink, you know, you are going to springtime now. So are all those wines that you can sit in the in in the in the desk, you know, in the in the terrace. Enjoy a lovely evening, you know, with your partner, with your friend, with your wife, you know, and having fun there uh, with a lovely Sauvignon Blanc. So that's we we really, you know, focus on on wines who are coming all from single vineyard. We have two estates, one estate in the coast where the Sauvignon Blanc came. And all the reds came from here, from Los Lingas, where I live. All right, Cristobal, I got a couple other questions for you. First of all, if, all, if some of us wanted to fly down to Chile once all this madness is gone, what would you think would be a great time to come down there? And then secondly, I'm going to murder this pronunciation because I don't know anything about Spanish, but I recommended pairing this tonight with churrasco, with Pedre. How'd I do? Can you say that for real? Ah, uh, I, I think I don't know uh, if you know churrasco, guys, but I was just eating churrasco with my family. A very, uh, a, a, a thin slice of beef, you know, that you can cook over the, a flat pan, you know, we're doing here over a, a, a pan that the, we put over the fire. And that churrasco, you can uh, blend it with a touch of Pedre. Pebre is, is smashed onions, uh, tomato, some uh, herbs, you know, that you can make. Uh, and all that uh, is, uh, is all pairing very nice with it, this Carmenet. I also love this with pizza, with risotto, with pasta. I think one of the big good pairing for Carmenet is all kind of uh, Italian food. I... I think Italian food, uh, I still, I want to make a big uh, salut for my friends from Italy. They are having a lot, lot of travels there. So salut for Italy, lovely place. And, uh, you know, we, I, I remember that uh, Carmenere also pair really good with this kind of food. Uh, I think finally, you know, when we're talking about the uh, uh, cepage of red wine, we're looking for that uh, matching with food. We make wines for feeding with, with to, to, to keep the foods alive, you know, to keep the, the life of the food alive uh, back. For me, wine is, uh, is, is bringing us life. It's a, it's a drink, it's a juice, it's uh, something very, very important that uh, give us, you know, a lot of uh, energy and uh, good vibes and uh, I think that's one of uh, our uh, main, uh, main challenge when we make wines. Cristobal and Cristobal and Lisa, I, I don't think you guys understand how much of a privilege this is for us to have you guys in our living rooms in Montana so far away and all the stuff we're going all going through. Um, it is so fun and um, I absolutely love it. Um, thank you for all your time. And we will seriously sell a lot of your wine and um, we'll work hard on, on being good, good neighbors. So thank, thank you so much for showing up. We thank you for such a great concept. This is just amazing for us to see. And I'm spreading the word about this idea across the country and a lot of people are adopting it. So know you started a big trend from coast to coast that is uh is going to be something that really gets us all through this really um difficult time right now right yeah it's very fun anybody have any other further questions i want to mention bob and beth Sobolek. they always um are on this and they're really good cooks or I, beth sorry i think it's bob <laughs> but anyway he, he said he did an herb drub pork loin with a honey mustard garlic glaze Ooh, with roasted yeah. vegetables, that sounds just perfect for this wine, don't you think? That does sound great. 
Hey, someone was asking uh, Cristobal, when is the best time to visit um, Chile? Oh, to yeah. visit the, the winery? I think for me, I always love to go, you know, to, uh, to, to travel, you know, in the springtime, it's always lovely. And also late in the summer, because summer here can be very dry and warm. Uh, we go in a, a, an average temperature uh, here in Chile uh, around in summertime around 90s, 90 to 95. It's very dry, so it's not uh, never humid. But if you came in the springtime, you know, if you came from in Chile from October to November, or if you came in March, March of April, for me are the two beautiful times to come here uh, and visit the vineyard are all invited guys to visit our winery here in Chile. You know, we are not far from Santiago, the capital city. We are just one hour and 20 minutes south. Uh, it's, and it's a fantastic, absolutely. Thanks for this invitation because it's my first time that I make a, 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 a Zoom tasting in my life. <laughs> I will always uh, remember this, uh, all you guys here, uh, I've been, I travel a lot during the year uh, with my, my colleague Cristobal, but uh, I think the world uh, with this uh, big uh, issue that is happening today will change in many ways. And I think in that way, we also have to take that good things that will happen, you know, and be able to be communicated from thousands of miles of distance uh, at the same time. Uh, I'm very honored of that. So cheers, guys, everybody, huh? Cheers. Cheers. All right, thanks again. So tomorrow night, we have a really, really fun um, setup. It's a rosé from Irie Vineyards from Oregon. It's a rosé of Pinot Noir. And that's the most interesting, to me at least, I've traveled to the Willamette a lot. The most interesting of all, um, the guy that started is, is um, David Lett, and he's, they call him Papa Pino. He was the first one to, he, he, he has an enology degree from University of California, Davis. And they all told him he was crazy to go to Oregon and plant wine or vineyards, plant anything because it's too wet and it's too cold and blah, blah, blah. And so he goes up there and he plants. And now Pinot Noir is the absolute capital of Willamette Valley. Um, and to me, it's the best Pinot Noirs in America. And we have a lady on tomorrow night that's going to tell the story of Papa Pino and and the whole Oregon wine scene. So please join us again tomorrow night and thank I can't say thank you enough to you guys. It's so much fun. Thank you. Thanks for supporting us and we'll we'll talk to you tomorrow, hopefully. Bye. Oh thanks. Bye bye. Big pleasure Here's to to participate here. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.